Hello, everybody, and welcome into episode number 132 of the Bible Reading Podcast. Today's big Bible question, is there a religion that God calls pure and faultless? Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the weekend. As a heads up, the next few podcasts, maybe the next five or six or so, might be a little on the shorter than normal side as I am preparing for a small road trip with my daughter, and I will have to record a few episodes to upload while gone. So the plan is, Lord willing, for there to be an uninterrupted stream of episodes all next week. But to do that, I'll need to record a few in advance. Rejoice ye podcast saints who like the shorter episodes, but mourn all ye who yearn and hearken with joy unto the longer episodes. This should all return back to normal by next Saturday again, Lord willing. Today's Bible readings include Numbers chapter 17 and 18, Psalms 55, Isaiah 7, and James chapter 1, which is our focus passage for today, based on that really awesome final two verses, James 1, 26 and 27. So let's go read the passage and come back and talk about the kind of religion that God likes. James 1, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation, but let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises, and together with the scorching wind, dries up the grass. Its flower falls off, and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activities. Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless, and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So, is there a religion that God calls pure and faultless? Yes, and it's James 127-ism. Okay, thanks for listening to today's show. Godspeed. Well, okay, I'm kidding. Shorter show, but not quite that show. We haven't even read numbers yet. Well, one thing I want to address before we get to the big Bible question, what religious religion does God find pure and faultless, is that word religion. It's used all throughout James 1, 26 and 27. It's the Greek word threskia. In one sense, religion is a pretty good translation of the word, 
But the problem is, to a modern reader, I believe the word religion means something quite a bit different than what James is actually communicating here. When most people today hear the word religion, they think about all of the various different religions of the world, all of the different practices of faith and beliefs about salvation and that sort of thing. And I'm I'm pretty certain that's not at all what James is talking about here. He's not talking about all of the various ways that, that religions have to approach God. I th- think he's talking about uh, how Christians should approach God. He's talking about the Christian religion only. And so I think a better translation of the word here is God-fearing for at least two reasons. Well, number one, threskia, the Greek word, is derived from a Greek adjective, threskos, which means fearful or trembling. And it would seem that the the an understanding of fear is inherent in the word that's being used there. And it's that word is sometimes used in the context of worshiping God. And second, James isn't talking, like I said, about all the religions of the world. He's telling Christians how to please God, how to walk in a God-fearing, God-pleasing way. Now, that said, I can't find a single modern translation that agrees with me, so you should trust the translators and not me. Regardless, I do believe that every modern Bible translator would agree that James 1, 26 and 27 is teaching us what God finds pure and faultless, the kind of behavior and actions and heart attitude that God finds pleasing. And there are three big elements to it. Let's cover those pretty briefly. Number one, to please God, we got to control our tongues, our words, our speech. James is going to hit us on this a couple of times in this book. Uh, and we don't have to speculate about what he means when he says it's important to control your tongue, because in James 3, 9 and 10, he says it. He says, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Well, so what is he talking about in terms of controlling our tongues? Specifically, he's talking about cursing people. And and I don't think that's the uh, old Southern equivalent of cussing. I think it's wishing well, using your words to harm people. And of course, that could include cussing. But cursing is basically attacking uh, wishing evil on and, and even maybe even literally cursing may your toes shrivel up and your ears fall off, something along those lines. Well, James says that blessing and cursing shouldn't come out of the same mouth. We should be people of blessing, not people of cursing. Well, second element of pure and faultless religion, according to God, is that we must look after orphans and widows. Those who are fatherless, motherless, or parentless uh, is what an orphan is, and those who have lost their husband. How big of a deal is this to God? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the fact of the matter is, it's a huge deal to God. And I'm not sure that Christians today really understand how close of an issue to the heart of God this is, but we're going to try to understand it today. Deuteronomy 10, 16 and 18 says, Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. Shout out to my friend Dan, who loves that passage. How about Psalms 146, 9? The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. Or how about Exodus 22, 12, uh, 22 through 23? Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. You were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or fatherless. If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. Well, we'll see in what God thinks about foreigners. He protects them and loves them. And what he thinks about the widows and the fatherless, he takes care of them. How about Deuteronomy 24, 18 through 20? When you're harvesting in your field and overlook a sheaf, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns 
so that the Levites and the foreigners, the fatherless and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Psalm 68, uh, 4 through 6. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds, rejoice before him, his name is the Lord, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. Or how about Psalms 82, 2 through 4, this is God castigating the other Elohim and the divine counsel, and he says, how long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That's a challenge by God. Uh, Deuteronomy 12, 27, 19, cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. Then all the people shall say, amen. Jeremiah 22, three through four, this is what the Lord says, do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. That's pretty powerful. Zechariah 7, 9 through 11. This is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Psalms 10, verse 14. But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Proverbs 23, 9 uh, through 11. Do not move an ancient boundary stone or encroach on the fields of the fatherless, for their defender is strong. He will take up their case against you. Isaiah 1, 16 through 18, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Well, what is the the big sins talked about there? Well, there's several, but one of them is refusing to take care of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. So what does God consider pure and good and faultless and appropriate God-fearing and religion? It is taking care of the widow and the fatherless or the orphan. It's a huge huge deal to him. As Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, the way we treat the least of these, which includes the widows and the orphans, is the way we treat him. One more element, James says, pure and faultless God-fearing or religion is to keep yourself from being stained or transformed or uh, sullied by the ways of the world. And in James 4, 4 and 5, James really goes on to Uh, sharply elaborate this point as well. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture said, the script, the spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely. Wow, you adulterous people, man, that's a slap in the face. Friendship with the world is hostility to God. Oh my gosh, if you want to be the friend of the world, you become the enemy of God, man, that's challenging. So if we want to please God, we got to take care of the widow of orf- and the orphan. We've got to watch our words, particularly not to, to avoid attacking people. We bless and we don't curse, and we've got to not be worldly. We, we're in the world, we're not of the world, we're not stained by the world, we're not friends with the world, we're not worldly, because when we are, we become an enemy of God. Well, as a kid, you sometimes wonder if your parents have favorites. As a youth minister, I definitely saw parents with kids who were their favorites and kids who weren't. As a dad of five, I get, I really don't think I've had to struggle with that all that much. My All my kids are different, but I don't think I've really ever had a favorite. They're kind of all my favorite. Uh, the, I'll, I don't know. I'm not trying to sound great or anything, but it's just not an issue I've struggled with. But I do sometimes wonder about God, though. 
Does he have favorites? Now, if he does, I think I know who they are. And I think they're the widows and the orphans and the oppressed. And I'm not even kidding. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. Well, let's continue on in our reading. Numbers chapter 17, verse 1. The Lord instructed Moses, speak to the Israelites and take one staff from them for each ancestral tribe, 12 staffs from all the leaders of their tribes. Write each man's name on his staff. Write Aaron's name on Levi's staff because there's to be one staff for the head of each tribe. Then place them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. The staff of the man I choose will sprout and I will rid myself of the Israelites' complaints that they have been making about you. So Moses spoke to the Israelites and each of their leaders gave him a staff, one for each of the leaders of their tribes, 12 staffs in all. Aaron's staff was among them. Moses placed the staffs before the Lord in the tent of testimony. The next day, Moses entered the tent of testimony and saw that Aaron's staff, representing the house of Levi, had sprouted, formed buds, blossomed, and produced almonds. Moses then brought out all the staffs from the Lord's presence to all the Israelites. They saw them, and each man took his own staff. The Lord said to Moses, put Aaron's staff back in front of the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels so that you may put an end to their complaints before me or else they will die. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Then the Israelites declared to Moses, Look, we're perishing. We're lost. We're all lost. Anyone who comes near the Lord's tabernacle will die. We will, will we all perish? Numbers chapter 18, verse 1. The Lord said to Aaron, You, your sons, and your ancestral family will be responsible for iniquity against the sanctuary. You and your sons will be responsible for iniquity involving your priesthood. But also bring your relatives with you from the tribe of Levi, your ancestral tribe, so that they may join you and assist you and your sons in front of the tent of testimony. They are to perform duties for you and for the whole tent. They must not come near the sanctuary equipment or the altar, otherwise both they and you will die. They are to join you and guard the tent of meeting, doing all the work at the tent, but no unauthorized person may come near you. You are to guard the sanctuary and the altar so that wrath may not fall on the Israelites again. Look, I have selected your fellow Levites from the Israelites as a gift for you, assigned by the Lord to work at the tent of meeting. But you and your sons will carry out your priestly responsibilities for everything concerning the altar and for what is inside the curtain, and you will do that work. I am giving you the work of the priesthood as a gift, but an unauthorized person who comes near the sanctuary will be put to death. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, Look, I put you in charge of the contributions brought to me. As for all the holy offerings of the Israelites, I have given to them to you and your sons as a portion and a permanent statute. A portion of the holiest offerings kept from the fire will be yours. Every one of their offerings that they give me, whether the grain offering, sin offering, or guilt offering, will be most holy for you and your sons. You are to eat it as a most holy offering. Every male may eat it. It is to be holy to you. The contribution of their gifts also belongs to you. I have given all the Israelites presentation offerings to you and to your sons and daughters as a permanent statute. Every ceremonially clean person in your house may eat it. I am giving you all the best of the fresh oil, new wine, and grain which the Israelites give to the Lord as their first fruits. The first fruits of all that is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, belong to you. Every clean person in your house may eat them. Everything in Israel that is permanently dedicated to the Lord belongs to you. The firstborn of every living thing, human or animal, presented to the Lord belongs to you. But you must certainly redeem a human firstborn and redeem the firstborn of an unclean animal. You will pay the redemption price for a month-old male according to your assessment. Five shekels of silver by the standard sanctuary shekel, which is twenty garas. However, You must not redeem the firstborn of an ox or a sheep or a goat. They are holy. You are to splatter their blood on the altar and burn their fat as a food offering for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But their meat belongs to you. It belongs to you like the beast breast of the presentation offering and the right thigh. I give to you and to your sons and daughters all the holy contributions that the Israelites present to the Lord as a permanent statute. It is a permanent covenant of salt before the Lord for you as well as your offspring. The Lord told Aaron, You will not have an inheritance in their land. There will be no portion among them for you. I am your portion and your inheritance among the Israelites. 
Look, I've given the Israelite, the Levites, every tenth in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work they do, the work of the tent of meeting. The Israelites must never again come near the tent of meeting or they will incur guilt and die. The Levites will do the work of the tent of meeting and they will bear the consequences of their iniquity. The Levites will not receive an inheritance among the Israelites. This is a permanent statute throughout your generations. For I have given them the tenth that the Israelites present to the Lord as a contribution for their inheritance. That is why I told them that they would not receive an inheritance among the Israelites. The Lord instructed Moses, Speak to the Levites and tell them, When you receive from the Israelites the tenth that I have given you as your inheritance, you are to present part of it as an offering to the Lord, a tenth of the tenth. Your offering will be credited to you as if it it were your grain from the threshing floor or the full harvest from the wine press. You are to present an offering to the Lord from every tenth you receive from the Israelites. Give some of it to the priest Aaron as an offering to the Lord. You must present the entire offering due the Lord from all your gifts. The best part of the tenth is to be consecrated. Tell them further, once you have presented the best part of the tenth and it is credited to you Levites as the produce of the threshing floor of the wine press, then you and your household may eat it anywhere. It is your wage in return for your work at the tent of meeting. You will not incur guilt because of it once you have presented the best part of it, but you must not defile the Israelites' holy offerings so that you will not die. Psalm chapter 55. God, listen to my prayer and do not hide from my plea for help. Pay attention to me and answer me. I am restless and in turmoil with my complaint because of the enemy's words, because of the pressure of the wicked, for they bring down disaster on me and harass me in anger. My heart shudders within me. Terrors of death sweep over me. Fear and trembling grip me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, if only I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and find rest. How far away I would flee. I would stay in the wilderness. Selah. I would hurry to my shelter from the raging wind and the storm. Lord, confuse and confound their speech, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night, they make the rounds on its walls. Crime and trouble are within it. Destruction is inside it. Oppression and deceit never leave its marketplace. Now it is not an enemy who insults me, otherwise I could bear it. It is not a foe who rises up against me, otherwise I could hide from him. But it is you, a man who is my peer and my companion and good friend. We used to have close fellowship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. Let death take them by surprise. Let them go down to Sheol alive, because evil is in their homes and within them. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. I complain and groan morning, noon, and night, and he hears my voice. Though many are against me, he will redeem me from my battle unharmed. God, the one enthroned from long ago, will hear and will humiliate them. Selah. Because they do not change and do not fear God. My friend acts violently against those at peace with him. He violates his covenant. His buttery words are smooth, but war is in his heart. His words are softer than oil, but they are drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. God, you will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed and treachery will not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 1. This took place during the reign of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah. Aram's king Rezin and Israel's king Pekah, son of Remaliah, went to fight against Jerusalem, but they were not able to conquer it. When it became known to the house of David that Aram had occupied Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the hearts of his people trembled like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son Sher Jashub to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool by the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly because of these two smoldering sticks. The fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. For Aram, along with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah, has plotted harm against you. They say, let's go up against Judah, terrorize it, and conquer it for ourselves. Then we can install Tabil's son as king in it. This is what the Lord God says. It will not happen. It will not occur. The chief city of Aram is Damascus. The chief of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The chief city of Ephraim is Samaria, and the chief of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. 
If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. Isaiah said, Listen, house of David. Is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will be eating curds and honey. For before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring on you, your people, and your father's house such a time as has never been seen since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. On that day, the Lord will whistle to flies at the farthest streams of the Nile and to bees in the land of Assyria. All of them will come and settle in the steep ravines, in the clefts of the rocks, in all the thorn bushes, in all, in all the water holes. On that day, the Lord will use a razor hired from beyond the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria, to shave the hair on your heads, the hair on your legs, and even your beards. On that day, a man will raise a young cow and two sheep, and from the the abundant milk they give, he will eat curds, for every survivor in the land will eat curds and honey. And on that day, every place where there were a thousand vines worth a thousand pieces of silver will become thorns and briars. A man will go there with bows and arrows, because the whole land will be thorns and briars. You will not go to all the hills that were once tilled with a hoe, for fear of the thorns and briars. Those hills will be places for oxen to graze and for sheep to trample. Amen. Well, friends, I hope that the Word of God was edifying and encouraging for you today. It was not as short an episode as I thought, but tomorrow's might be shorter. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He shine His light on you. Good day to you and Godspeed.